So, uh, so we are very happy um, to have you here and uh, to, to welcome you to our virtual Clarin uh, event. Uh, this is an event organized by uh, Thomas Gaillard, Frank Sinato, and myself. We are hosted by Clarin and supported by the Humanum uh, Consortium Corley. Just a few words about uh, today's session. Please make sure that your microphones are off uh, so we can avoid any interference during the talks. At the end of each presentation, you will have some time to ask your questions. And if you want to do so, just raise your hands. You have a, a Zoom function below uh, to get in touch with the chairs and the presenters. And I would also remind you to uh, to keep in mind that we are recording this session, so if you do not wish to appear in the video, uh, please make sure your camera is off. And uh, for the speakers, uh, our timekeeper, uh, Thomas Gaia, will uh, let you know just five minutes before the end of your talk that uh, you have uh, still five minutes. So today we will talk about bilingual. We will talk about bilingual and multilingual corpora as used by researchers from different domains in focus linguistics. We will talk about the features and particularities of parallel, comparable, and dialectal corpora, new or uh, already published. And we also we will also try to provide some demonstrations on how to collect and build. Uh, and annotate, explore, analyze, and archive such corpora in an interoperable way. But before that, we have planned two introductory presentations, one about Clarin, the European Research Infrastructure on Digital uh, Language Resources, and one about Corley, the French Clarin Knowledge Center about Language Corpora. So after these two short presentations, we will leave the floor to uh, Maximilien Guerin, who will present a motodialectal uh, corpus, then to Anne-Marie Verkerk and Luigi Talamo, who will talk about the parallel corpus of Indo-European languages, and finally to Thomas Gaia, co-organizer of this event, who will present a comparable learner corpus. So let me start with just a short presentation of Clarin, of, this Cl of the Clarin uh, infrastructure. Uh, so my name is Eva Soroli. I'm associate professor of uh, psycholinguistics and uh, ambassador of Clarin uh, since 2021. Uh, so I would like to talk about so just a short presentation of uh, five, 10 minutes on the European, the European research infrastructure, Clarin, and the services offered to researchers like uh, ourselves who try to go beyond stakeholders' positions and prescriptive directions and mostly interested uh, on, on usage-based uh, corpora, comparable multilingual corpora. So first of all, what is, uh, what is Clarin? Uh, Clarin stands for uh, Common Language Resources and Technology Infrastructure. It's a legal entity, an ERIC, a European Research Infrastructure Consortium since 2012. It is also recognized as an established landmark infrastructure by the ESFRI, the European Strategy Forum on Research Infrastructures, since 2016. Clarin is for scholars in the humanities and social sciences and uh, aims to provide easy and sustainable access to digital language data in written, spoken, and multilingual, multimodal forms. Uh, also, advanced tools that help discover, explore, annotate, analyze, or combine language data wherever they are located through a single sign on environment. Um, Clarin serves as an ecosystem for, 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 for language and knowledge sharing in language uh, data sets and is an integral part of European Open Science Cloud. Uh, we're talking here about a distributed infrastructure with 70 uh, data centers and knowledge centers. Uh, Clarin is present in 25 countries, in 22 member countries, two observers, and one 
third party partner. Um, but what, what we mean by language resources and by language resources uh, infrastructures. So in Clarin, we use the term language resource to refer to a broad range of uh, speech and language data types in machine readable form, as well as tools and services for the processing of those language data. So resources are typically written or spoken corpora and lexicons, multimodal resources, grammars, terminologies, uh, or domain-specific databases, dictionaries, ontologies, multimedia databases. But We've also- got five minutes. Thank you. But also software tools for the preparation, the collection, the management, the use and the reuse of, of such data. Tools can be management and exploration systems, OCRs, uh, pipelines, speech and language processing systems, environments for manual annotation, evaluation, and the like. Uh, Clarin is for researchers in digital humanities, in linguistics and philology, for those who work in the domain of translation, in lexicography, in the domain of literary studies, and also for all those who are interested in comparative work like linguists, historians, and also for research domains like political and social sciences, uh, media studies, culture, anthropology, etc. Um, knowledge, language data, and resources are organized in Clarin resource families in CRFs. CRFs are user-friendly overviews per data type of the available language resources in the Clarin infrastructure. They are organized in corpora families. We have 13 corpora families, five families of lexical resources, and four two families. And these are uh, a, uh, families that provide information about the most important data, metadata, brief descriptions of the resources, as well as downloadable uh, resources. So for what we are interested here today, bilingual and multilingual corpora are not organized in specific resource families. However, you can find such kind of resources in the historical CRF, also in the L2 learner CRF, the parallel corpora CRF, and many others. Um, there's a technical infrastructure of Clarin, uh, which is a network of data centers. It provides an ecosystem for fair language resources. So findable, accessible, interoperable, reusable language resources. These resources are hosted in various centers that can be discovered also uh, centrally within the VLO platform. For those who are familiar with the VLO, it's the Virtual Language Observatory of Clarin, where you have data and metadata from various centers that can be selected and then processed through the language resource switch board. The language, uh, the language resource switch board um, allows to discover web services for the analysis of the selected uh, data. Um, the aim in this infrastructure is to to offer knowledge in an organized way. So you have uh, digital humanities course registries where you can uh, access programs and courses in digital humanities. Uh, you have also the Tour de Clarin and Impact Stories, which provide useful information about what are the various national consortia and what specific centers can offer in terms of data, tools, and services. You have also teaching uh, with Clarin and video lectures, which are two new initiatives uh, in this uh, infrastructure. Funding opportunities, but also knowledge sharing infrastructures, uh, which are organized in uh, specialized knowledge centers. And this is the part that um, uh, I would like to focus on today. Uh, especially with the presentation uh, by Christophe Paris and Céline Houdin, who will present 
the Clarin Knowledge Center, uh, the French Clarin Knowledge Center, Corley. Uh, Clarin Knowledge Centers do not share uh, data, but rather uh, competencies. So uh, I was talking earlier about uh, centers in the Clarin. So we have B, C, and K centers. I see we have a lot of participants from France. So France participates with three C centers and one K center, one knowledge center. Uh, we will get back to this point with uh, the presentation of uh, Cordy. Um, K centers have their specific areas of expertise. Uh, centered uh, on individual languages, on specific modalities, on uh, specific linguistic topics. One such case center is the recently certified Clarin case center, Corley, here in France. And I'll let my colleagues from Corley say a bit more about uh, the expertise of this center. So to conclude, if you are interested in what Clarin can offer to you as a researcher in terms of corpora, in terms of uh, annotation, analysis, uh, you can get involved in several ways. You can deposit your data or collect data from the databases, uh, contact the specialized case center or your national coordinator, uh, read the Tour de Claran. We have uh, several volumes about this. And also join us with a mailing list or uh, check out the events and follow us on Twitter. So I'm looking forward to uh, to hear from you, you can contact us also by email, and thank you for your attention. Um, now, I would like to uh, welcome Christophe Paris and Céline Pouda, coordinators of the French Knowledge Center Corley. Christophe is INSERM uh, researcher in uh, language acquisition and uh, corpus linguistics. He's working at the University of Nanterre and the Modico Lab in the domain of oral corpus, uh, language development, language change, and language pathology. And Céline is Associate Professor of Linguistics and Discourse Analysis at the University of Côte d'Azur, working on textual typology and corpus linguistics. So they will talk about Corley, the French Clarin Knowledge Center. So the floor is yours. And yes, so we're going with Celine together to present you uh, Corley, the, the Clarin K Center in France. And uh, first of all, Corley is uh, what we call here Humanum Consortium. Humanum is a structure that in France whose goal is to help all uh, humanities in everything which is uh, digital. So to help them having a better uh, digital access, better tools and better data and so on. And, and so Corley is a, a consortium of Humanum dedicated to language linguistics and corpus linguistics. The, the main goal of Corley is to uh, promote uh, corpus visibility, uh, promote uh, reuse, reusability of the courses, or easy access, good practices, and so on, and to help developing corpora tools and formats. The most important thing about Corley is that uh, we want to help researchers to carry out the complex tasks that they have to do using corpuses in linguistics. But the main point for me is that Corley has what uh, I call a bottom approach. Corley helps researcher to exchange and discuss together to find when appropriate common solutions. And in many cases, if a solution exists already in some people and you have to share them, you have to make them more well known and used by the, the most people possible. And so we, 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 we start with the practices that the people really use. We do not try to have, I will say, uh, general ID that we want to, to give to everyone. We really try to listen to what people have to, to say about linguistics, uh, corpus linguistic, what tools they are using, what kind of corpus they are using, and then we help them to share all everything together. 
something very important also that uh, Cordy was founded in, in 2016, but uh, however, it exists uh, as a consortium in Humanum since uh, 2011. And I remember very well that uh, when this started at that time, Humanum asked us to make available corpora and to have corpora available. And the, one of the first thing that I remember that the people were saying within the consortium, but we have to, to do it correctly. We have to, uh, to say how a uh, corpus is correct, what is a good corpus. We have to, to tell to everyone our own previous expertise. So you saw that, you see that from the very beginning, without I have been being asked to do that. People in the community wanted to share their knowledge. And so we did that, but at the same time, we did that, uh, what was, uh, what we, we were asked for. It was to help many projects, to help many corpuses, to get published, to get known, because in many cases, the corpora were not finished, were not, uh, given to the public, they are not uh, given to a repository, we are not available, and we wanted to help that. But uh, everything changed in life, and so the, the politics of humaning did change, and uh, a new orientation appeared a couple of years ago, and uh, we were asked by uh, Humanum to be more open to Europe, which is fine for us, and to promote Clarine in France. And Clarine is a very, very interesting group and they, are, they do very interesting work. And so it was fine for us. And, and to switch more from pro promoting corpora to promoting the tools and the method and the good uh, practice of corpora uh, using. And also they ask us to promote fair data, open science, which in fact we did from a long time ago, but maybe not as well as it is presented now. And uh, we did it, why? Because uh, it's, it's a very long time since uh, linguists, they do not have so much money and they have to share their corpora, they have to publish their corpora and so on. So what is now obvious, I would say, and accepted by everyone was uh, something that we did before being asked for. And the, the main thing that we did at that time was create officially the, the, the case center. And the case center represent more or less what we usually do at, uh, at Corley. Uh, most of what we want to give in the case center is our own expertise, our own knowledge, our own, uh, I would say, experience. Uh, we help people to learn to use the tools and so on. Uh, Céline, give you a floor if you want. Uh, I, I can keep uh, PowerPoint and you tell me to, to switch page. So as Christophe says, uh, as Christophe said, so uh, our uh, knowledge uh, center it was uh, basically what we already did in our uh, consortium. So we provide recommendations for data collections and guidelines uh, for research design. Uh, with, uh, for instance, uh, technical manuals or ethical approval procedures, and also uh, guidelines for corpus station and evaluation and methodological recommendations to explore corpora and various data sets. And we also uh, very often organize training sessions uh, on data uh, repositories, uh, annotation principle and tools, and also uh, corpus exploration tools. And we also organized uh, training sessions on uh, metadata, conversions, and anonymizations. Um, now, uh, we, we, our orientation uh, uh, has uh, changed a bit because we are now uh, concentrating on uh, um, on new activities. So we had a, a new four-year project, which was validated by Humanum uh, in 2022. So we are still uh, currently uh, working on our, uh, in our network center, which is the basis actually of our uh, consort consortium. And also uh, our, uh, it's also where we, uh, 
uh, we keep a, a, a close connection uh, to our community. And uh, we are also uh, developing three new projects uh, aiming at building or improving tools for the community. Uh, so our three projects are the following. Uh, the first one uh, concentrates on collaborative annotation tools. So we have three uh, research directions uh, on corpus transcription and annotation, which is a collaboration uh, with um, the MSH Lorraine and um, the TAC tool, which is developed in Grenoble. Uh, we also have a, a, a a collaboration with uh, TU Darmstadt and uh, uh, the, the inception tool. And we also aim at uh, developing a classroom annotated resource uh, to connect students, professors and researchers and following the GUM model, which is developed in, uh, in Washington. So uh, our uh, second project uh, concentrates on capacitation. Uh, citation extraction and presentation so we are we have uh, we are currently uh, settling uh, five uh, working groups uh, on uh, the state of the art uh, conception relation to data uh, repositories and uh, uh, another group uh, works on uh, uh, more precise examples and usages uh, of such um, um, uh, procedure actually. And finally, uh, our uh, third project uh, aims at developing uh, an open French corpus because, uh, as you may know, uh, there is no uh, French uh, reference corpus uh, in France. So we want to help uh, developing uh, such a resource. Uh, and so we are currently working on uh, metadata. Uh, we have a cooperation uh, with another Humanium consortium, uh, the Cahier consortium, uh, which developed uh, uh, a big uh, genre, uh, Thesaurus. Um, and so uh, we, we will also start uh, this year to evaluate uh, the deposited uh, corpora, the quality and the, the standards used uh, in uh, in the in this corpora, and uh, we are we are also starting cooperate, cooperating with various uh, corpus builders uh, in this perspective. Um, so to achieve uh, actually this, uh, these three projects, so uh, we we need help, of course. So we <laughs> we we are uh, recruiting a half time engineer. Uh, and two trainees are currently working on projects uh, one and three on annotation and um, open French corpus. And we also uh, started a project uh, with uh, uh, Mayodac uh, in Toulouse. So a class of uh, computational linguistics uh, master students are currently working on the inception projects. And we, we are, uh, we, we organize a, uh, uh, a, a training uh, uh, next week uh, on this question. So you have five have, minutes. Yeah, but I, <laughs> um, so uh, this will have, of, of course, impact uh, on our case center because we will provide new documentation and good practices in relation uh, with uh, the work we are uh, uh, we are doing and these uh, three projects. Uh, we will also create uh, new tools and uh, corpus sets uh, that we will share with our European partners. Uh, and of course, we are very interested in cooperation with other uh, clarion centers uh, on the specific directions of our projects. So thank you for your attention. Because we have a few minutes left, uh, I just wanted to ask to add something that uh, we discussed very shortly with Eva just before is that uh, uh, there has not been yet uh, many things done on on Corley about the bilingualism, for example, corpus with different languages uh, together in the same corpus, and uh, it has always been for various reasons, time um, available for people and so on, difficult to have. Uh, effective uh, presentation like we have now. 
about multilingualism, the bilingualism. So I'm very happy about that. But I, I want to say that um, if there is an interest in that, it is something that probably we, we can develop more. Uh, it's something that exists. For example, myself with my students have already been working on bilingualism in corpora. So it's, I, I know that it's, it's not a problem. And so we will very be very happy, I think, in Koli to know your your problem, your your question, your issues, and maybe to to work on this more later. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Christophe and Celine. Um, I put in the chat the website for Cordly so people can contact directly the center if they have questions, but we have still uh, one minute. So if you, <laughs> if there are any questions, question. very, very targeted questions, maybe you can switch on your micro microphones and ask people. Uh, just a note that uh, we probably won't talk about that a uh, lot. But uh, you know that uh, the participant of France in, in Clarine is uh, on uh, about question. But I think that us in the case center, there's no way we are going to stop our participation in Clarine because uh, what we are doing, I think, is very interesting for everyone. And we, we get things from Clarine from for, for at least from the case center point, there's nothing going to change, I think. And I hope that France will next year be in, Cla in Clarine officially. In any way, uh, France is part of Clarin in terms of um, say C centers and yeah. A centers, but of course we hope that uh, she will, France will be able to join as a full member in the next years. Uh, at least we're working on that <laughs> <laughs> all together. Um, uh, so. Um, in the next presentation uh, will be on uh, multi-intellectual corpora. Uh, we would like to welcome Maximilien Guerin, who is a postdoctoral uh, researcher at the CNRS Research Unit HTL at the University of Paris. He's a typologist specializing in morphology and syntax. His research focuses on African and Romance languages, especially the Gallo-Romance varieties spoken in central France. So uh, Maximilien is working on the constitution of written and oral corpora, and today he will talk about the multi-dialectal -dialect corpus of the Crescent dialects. So, um, good afternoon. I'm going to present uh, the multi-dialectal dialectal corpus of the Crescent dialects. Uh, in fact, more the multi-dialectal corpora and the collection, the exploitation, and the analysis of these uh, of this corpora. Uh, so first, uh, what is uh, the linguistic crescent? In fact, the linguistic crescent is uh, an area situated on the northern fringe of uh, the Massif Central in uh, central France. Uh, the uh, gallo romance varieties spoken in this area uh, display simultaneously uh, features of oil varieties as a French, Poitva saint Berichon, and features of oak varieties as uh, Limousin, uh, Limousin on the west uh, side and uh, Auvergne on the east side. In fact, the western part of the crescent is uh, often called marchois or marchis in English, and the uh, eastern part is often called uh, bourbonnais or bourbonnais doc. Uh, the crescent is an area with a lot of variation. If you uh, travel over than uh, 20 kilometers, the intercomprehension between speakers may be difficult. So very great variation. Uh, about the population of uh, this area. In fact, uh, the question varieties are really endangered. Uh, after the Second World War, uh, the speakers stop to um, transmit the languages, the varieties to the next uh, generation for some reasons. I have no time to explain that, but uh, the result 
is now uh, the native and uh, fluent speakers are all over uh, than uh, 70 years old. And uh, the speakers between 40 years old and 70 years old are uh, terminal speakers. They have some knowledge, some skills, but they are not fluent. And all inhabitants uh, under uh, 40 years old uh, are French monolinguals, in fact. Uh, the question uh, is, uh, question varieties are languages or varieties of oral tradition. Uh, there is no written literature except some recent texts. Uh, there is no standard or literary language. Each one speaks uh, in her or his own variety. And uh, the few existing text, texts are written in specific dialects, in specific varieties. Uh, what about our aims to uh, build, to build, to make this corpus? First of all, is to save what can be saved, because because of the age of the speakers, because of the situation. Um, about 2040, in 2040, there will no more native speakers, uh, so it's an emergency to collect these uh, varieties because no one did it uh, before uh, before it. So why make this corpus? Two uh, aims. First, make the corpus accessible to the local population because uh, um, the local population want to have some text, they want to have some uh, works about uh, their own varieties and uh, we need, uh, we must, um, make this accessible to uh, them. And second, of course, make the corpus useful for research, especially our research in women's linguistics, typology, sociolinguistics, natural language processing, and of course, phonetics, phonology, etc. cetera. Uh, to make this corpus, we uh, collect data uh, thanks to feedworks. So we made feedworks in over than uh, 70 uh, towns or villages uh, in the question areas, in the question area. Uh, so on the map, you can see uh, all the towns and villages we uh, visited to collect uh, data. The two, mm, to collect this uh, data, we have some different um, kind of uh, solution, but one of them is to use linguistic questionnaires. So uh, we uh, created uh, some questionnaires, um, lexical questionnaires as a basic lexicon about nouns organized by uh, semantic fields, uh, pronouns, other, it means uh, it means uh, prepositions, adverbs, adjectives, etc. An additional lexicon questionnaire is to um, to do a more uh, a deeper uh, collect. If we, if uh, we want to um, write a grammar or a dictionary, so additional lexicon uh, information. Uh, a specific lexicon about calendar time and a big lex uh, questionnaire about a conjugation. Uh, we uh, collect, we uh, collect uh, the, we are collecting uh, information about the conjugations of twen between 22 to 24 verbs in each varieties. So it's used for our feedback. The results are archived uh, on a specific website, uh, Corpus Croissant, Corpus Croissant, uh, um, specifically for the lexical and morphological part. So uh, the lexicon and uh, the conjugations and some uh, other information about morphology. Uh, they are organized. Uh, um, each, each file, it's a very short file with only uh, one semantic file or one tense for each verb. Uh, it's um, so it's uh, easy to compare information to compare files between uh, different varieties thanks to that uh, to this uh, organization. 
Second, uh, an audiobooks, uh, uh, not another website, audiobooks questions about texts. We wrote, uh, we wrote uh, some books about question varieties. I will speak about that afterwards. And uh, for some of them, uh, we uh, recorded uh, texts or lexicon of these uh, books. Uh, there, we, there, is, there are two aims for that. Um, first, uh, for the readers to have the audio versions, the oral versions of all uh, texts. And second, it's to have um, an oral corpus, uh, oral textual corpus, uh, which is uh, very important to us uh, for um, our work. Third, and the last part of the oral part of our corpus, it's uh, the speaking atlas of the regional languages of France. So this atlas is not uh, from us, it's uh, an atlas developed, in, developed um, in the laboratory LIMSI. And uh, the um, base of the atlas is to translate the Aesop fable, uh, the north wind and the sun, into um, a big amount of, uh, lang of regional uh, languages in France, French uh, uh, yeah, yeah, regional languages in France. And uh, thanks to Philippe boulan Mareuil, we know uh, there is now a zoom on the quotient to more uh, to see uh, easy and in an easier way, the uh, quotient uh, translation we uh, give to that uh, atlas. The second part is the written part of our corpus. So we made a text corpus. Uh, so for instance, Conte Histoire en Parler de Nave, it's a book, uh, public book with uh, texts uh, with an orthographic transcription proposed by the author. Uh, an IPA transcription and a translation of its texts. And uh, these texts are also on the audiobook website for, for the oral part. And a more historical corpus, uh, because it's a Patoiserie de la Sutran, it's a text, it's a book published uh, 70 years ago. It's a the more historical we can do with these ideas because um, they are all oral tradition of languages. So um, there is so the historical corpus, orthographic transcription by the author. It's interesting for some and some reason to preserve uh, that uh, that uh, transcription and a new translation because the original edition. Uh, has no uh, translation, so I uh, I translated uh, the texts for this new edition. Uh, second part is the writing, uh, the translations of the Little Prince. So it's not original texts because it's translations, but it's really it's uh, really important because uh, this is perfect. Perfect. <laughs> Typological parallel corpus because we have the same text translating in uh, a lot of varieties. In fact, we have now around 20 translations. And uh, after, uh, at the end of the project, about 20, 25, maybe more. So uh, it's really important for uh, our typological uh, comparison. comparison uh, uh, in particular in syntax and morphology and morphosyntax. We discover a lot of uh, things thanks to that uh, translations. Uh, for our uh, work, we use, uh, we collected also metadata, uh, metadata about the informants, name, date of birth, gender, place of birth, uh, etc. And also, uh, metadata about the investigation itself, uh, the date of investigation, uh, the name of the investigator, uh, and so on and so forth. And these informations, which are not public, in, uh, of course, are, are useful for sociolinguistic studies. And we are now um, developing uh, our uh, sociolinguistic part uh, in our project. 
about the annotation of the corpus. In fact, uh, we, uh, we made the pragmatic choice, priority to the collection because the language are not endangered. In fact, they are dying. So uh, we need to collect the most we can uh, before the disappearing of the varieties. Um, but we uh, did some something about that. We proposed an organization. We made uh, an organization of the morphological part of uh, our corpus uh, in the data base about conjugation. I will present uh, the base afterwards, but we need to annotate the text is uh, in the future. So our corpus is mainly raw and primary data, large part of oral data or written data with an oral part, an oral uh, equivalent uh, with a kind of quality uh, which is um, decided to be used, uh, useful for uh, natural language processing and uh, phonetic studies. Uh, our target levels of analysis uh, was initially morph phonology and morphology, uh, while the oral part for phonology, phonetics, and we want to develop more the uh, semantics and syntax uh, aspect thanks to the translations, thanks to the textual corpus. And you see uh, here the uh, uh, conjugation website uh, we proposed. So the organization of the uh, morphological part of our oral corpus in a specific database about uh, conjugation, which is really a really important part of our research within our, pro our project about uh, question. <coughs> You have, uh, five some examples. you have five minutes. Yes, <laughs> some examples of our uh, results. Uh, most obvious uh, grammatical descriptions. So our grammatical descriptions are based on the uh, lexical corpus, morphological corpus, and textual corpus for syntax or morphosyntax uh, informations. Second, uh, for phonological analysis, uh, the possibility to create dialectal maps. Uh, this is from Amélie de Paris um, within her PhD dissertation. The, uh, she used so the uh, corpus to make some uh, dialectal maps and to uh, analyze, to study the phonological situation and the dialectal dialectal situation of the question. Other possibility for morphological analysis, hierarchical clustering. So uh, it's to group verbs according to endings, tenses, mood, uh, moods. Uh, this is a uh, work uh, in progress by uh, Marc Alassonier Tang. Uh, so it's automatically generated thanks to the uh, oral um, corpus. A second point, uh, male frequency septal coefficients. It's to create acoustic space for, for a phonetic comparison. Also by Mark Elosonia Tang, also work in progress. So it's only uh, examples uh, of the work in progress of the works in progress uh, based on our corpus. So uh, initial aims versus result. Uh, our aims are more or less achieved. Uh, there is a good reactions from the local population. Uh, our corpus is used for research work. And this corpus uh, will be uh, implications, uh, will have implications for language sciences. Uh, it provides uh, several data for under described dialects. It proposed a large typological parallel corpus especially the uh, Little Prince translations. Uh, it uh, proposed new elements for women's linguistics because these varieties were really underdescribed and uh, they display uh, some uh, features unknown 
in other romance languages, in other, uh, other romance varieties. So it's really important to uh, give this new information, this new data for romance linguistics and romance studies. But uh, there is some limitations. Uh, first, uh, the orthographic choices. Uh, they're not the same. Not the same conventions for all texts. It depends of the variety. It depends of the author. Uh, we must. We had to uh, do uh, pragmatic choices, uh, and there is problem for comparison. But it's a little problem because we use a lot the uh, phonetic transcriptions. So second part, it's about phonetic transcription because uh, there is some phonetic issues to solve about the phonological uh, system and the phonetic realizations of some uh, vowels and uh, consonants, especially vowels. Uh, there is some point to uh, solve uh, to be sure about the realization. Third, uh, some parts of the area, the, in some parts of the area, we have some difficulties to find speakers because uh, the language is dying, but uh, the processes of disappearing um, uh, is uh, slow in some uh, part and really fast, really rapid in some other, and there is no more speakers in some part of the area. It's a, difficulty for us uh, for our dialectal uh, analysis. And of course, there is enormous amount to do uh, in the future. So our future perspectives, it's to continue to develop our corpora, uh, find uh, new places, uh, translate more versions of the little prints, uh, record more audiobooks, more, tex more texts, uh, create uh, more online tools, our like um, as uh, our uh, conjugation by base, etc. Of course, do an annotation work, especially for texts. Uh, find a more durable archive for uh, our um, corpus. For instance, in uh, the Cocoon platform, which is dedicated for that and uh, continue our discussions about speakers and uh, authors' uh, rights, which is a very important point um, for the oral uh, corpus collection. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much for your, you very, much for very, your interesting presentation. very interesting presentation. Um, are there any questions in the room or through the chat? Okay, I see I that. I have a question as people are writing on the chat. Maybe I can pop up. Uh, okay, yeah. <laughs> I have just a, a short question about um, how, how you deal with um, eventual code switchings or code mixings that you find in your in your corpora um, do you annotate them do you have a kind of strategy or some kind of standard kind of strategy for coding these these parts uh, it's really difficult for two reasons for uh, first uh, these varieties as are really closed to french because uh, there are um, trans uh, transitional uh, area between oak and oil, and oil is French uh, for the most part. So uh, sometimes there is uh, 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 syntactic structures or uh, lexical um, items which are identical to French, but only uh, because of uh, evolution, a parallel evolution, but it's a coincidence, not really a coincidence, but it's not uh, code switching. Second part, uh, second problem is, uh, in fact, the population is in contact with French, really uh, massive contact with French over the 70 year, uh, 72 years ago. Uh, so, uh, in fact, part of our languages are 
contaminated are uh, by French, but it's a reality of the situation. So it's really difficult to, um, to cut uh, between uh, French and the varieties because sometimes uh, the forms are identical. It's not as in Arabic and French, or which uh, the situation can be really uh, easily uh, decided. But it's more difficult. But uh, in fact, uh, contributing in these languages, it's more uh, they uh, begin to speak in uh, question varieties, and suddenly, for some reason, because of uh, the theme of the conversation, uh, they switch. Uh, uh, with uh, French, but there is no uh, contamination. Um, uh, either they, um, uh, they speak in a question variety or in French, but they rarely uh, mixed uh, the uh, two varieties in the same uh, sentence. So if they speak in French, of course, we uh, uh, continue the conversation and we uh, try to provoke to um, to push them to speak in the specific variety and but code switching with French is a reality uh, sometimes. Thank you. Uh, I have a question. Go on, Frank. Th thank you, Maximilian, for your presentation. Uh, you mentioned a collaboration with Mark Tang. Can, could you um, say more about the, the uh, purpose of uh, this collaboration, uh, please? Uh, yes, so Mark Tang uh, became a member of our project uh, last year, I remember, or perhaps two years ago. Um, and uh, in fact, um, he's really interested by uh, the fieldwork. So he did uh, fieldworks uh, on one ton. Uh, it's uh, Lucia in Vienna. He's, he's going to, um, to make a grammar, a grammatical description of this variety and to, um, in, I think, yes, he's uh, also uh, working about the translation of the little prints in this variety. Uh, and the second part is uh, of um, his work with, uh, with us is uh, his um, capabilities, uh, capability to work in natural language processing. And we have some uh, works about uh, uh, phonetic aspects of uh, some uh, varieties. I, I, I have to um, to meet with him um, in one or two weeks to speak about that and to develop a project of uh, paper. And of course, uh, uh, and um, also uh, he works about uh, with Nicolanka about uh, some verbal aspects. Uh, of uh, the conjugations, uh, some of morphological aspect of the conjugation of some varieties. Just, I see that nobody's raised their hand. I do have a question, Maximilien, if you don't mind. Um, in terms of morphosyntactic, so morphosyntactic um, annotation, um, have you done any manual done any annotations manual? so far on the corpus? I can't remember what you said on this. Can you repeat? Uh, I'm not sure to understand. Has the corpus been Has annotated corpus in terms of morphosyntactic morpho uh, annotation? Uh, annotation. Uh, our corpus is not uh, yet annotated for morphosyntactic or syntactic information, part of speech, uh, agreement. No, no okay. not for now. Okay. okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. One very short question. Um, ah. If someone wants to use your corpus, how uh, can we uh, download it or download is it open it. in human Downloadable? Downloadable? Um, I, uh, in theory, it can be uh, downloaded. It can be uh, listened uh, from our uh, websites. I can uh, add the link. Uh, our uh, 
uh, website, the first website, and in the section uh, called uh, productions, we can see uh, so publication, uh, live audio, it's audiobooks, enregistrement, it's our uh, copies creation, but morphological and lexical part. Uh, uh, some part of the corpus is not public because uh, speakers do not want the, to be public, but 80% um, of the corpus is public. Bas conjugaison, uh, conjugation base, and uh, the other, uh, other productions, but not about corpus. So uh, you, it's public, you can uh, use. And if you have uh, questions about corpus, about the use using of the corpus, do not hesitate to contact uh, us or me or Nicolas Kahn about this. And we can uh, answer it to you and uh, uh, send you some information or part of the corpus uh, you need. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, so now um, I would like to welcome Anne-Marie uh, Verkerk and uh, Luigi Talamo from um, Saarland uh, University in Germany. So Anne-Marie, hello. Anne-Marie uh, is a linguist and typologist, uh, previously researcher at uh, the Max Planck Institute of Jena. Uh, she's working with corpus-based and phylogenetic methods for studying language diversity. And uh, her current, current research is on cross-linguistic patterns and information distribution. She's working with Luigi Talamo, also in Saarland uh, University in Germany, uh, corpus data scientist. And they're both working on a huge parallel corpus of Indo-European prose. And they will talk about this um, CIEP plus corpus. <laughs> So the floor is yours. Many thanks for having us, Eva, and uh, for organizing this event so we can share our, our thoughts and our work on, on multilingual corpora. Yes, so the pronunciation <laughs> that we intend is KEEP+. Plus. So the abbreviation obviously stands for uh, Parallel Corpus of Indo-European Prose Plus, but we aim to call it KEEP, and there's a Obviously, this means you know something that you want to keep forever in in uh, in English, right? So this is a work in progress. This corpus is unfinished at the moment. We are working on on parts of it and using that for a couple of different research projects, which we will uh, kind of list at the end of the talk. Uh, but this is the aim, right? So we aim to collect information about or texts in thirty three Indo European languages. These are sampled across the living branches and we hope to have a balanced sample there in the sense that we also aim to um, incorporate several Indo-Aryan and Iranian languages that are often missing when it comes to Indo-European. We complement that with 10 non-Indo-European languages and these are sampled across nine language families that's where the plus comes from and we collect 18 contemporary works of fiction or diary um, and contemporary, we mean that these are, they are reason, reasonably recent. Well, uh, so some of them are, well, well, you'll see them in a second. Some of them are a little bit older, but at least their translations are relatively recent. So if for any given language, all of these 18 works are available, so have been translated and we can get them, the corpus, so the subcorpus for that language consists of about 2 million tokens and 120k sentences. So it's not, huge but it's also not exactly small and we are right now at the stage that we have compiled the materials for about two-thirds of the languages that we want to sample and we have parsed in various ways about half of it but we are now you know we are we are facing the fact that some of the languages that we are collecting at the moment are are not so easy to get so i'm going to give you a little bit of background information so why, why are we doing this um, and the reason why we're doing this is that we applied recently for a big project. So in within our department here in, in Saarbrücken uh, and across another, well, across Germany, we have a big um, Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft project, which is called SFB one, uh, 1102. It's basically, it has to do with information theory and uh, linguistic encoding of information. Um, and what we want to do is study 
in a cross-linguistic fashion, the inter interdependency between dependency locality, word order variation, and information structure. So that's what this kind of triangle stands for there. So we know when it comes to dependency locality, we know that across languages, it's more or less a universal that languages like to put things that belong to each other so that are dependent on one another. And for example, a head dependent relationship, they put these close together. But while this is a universal fact and people have presented that across languages, we don't really know how languages manage to do that, right? So what specific features of language license that kind of behavior. Um, and on the other hand, we know that some languages have really variable word order. For, uh, so example, so the example on top is actually not the language that we sample. It's a, it's a, it's an Australian language, but also in within Indo-European, we have we encounter languages with pretty variable word order. And most of the time, we know that word order variability goes hand in hand with coding of information structure through word order. So languages use particular word order to indicate something about. Uh, the information status of, of reference, especially, so right of NPs and PPs within the sentence. So what we wanna do is incorporate information structure or status in a very explicit and cross-linguistic fashion to investigate communicative efficiency, right? So looking at dependency locality, um, but also looking at word order variation, what that, how that interacts and uh, also diachronically. So you have a little tree uh, at the, at the, at the, at the, in the top right there. So that's kind of what we are we are um, working we have been working on for the past two years in the hope that we will get funding to make a four-year project out of this and the rest of the presentation basically is about the setting up the the corpus so that we can actually have a good start with that uh, in, in summer if we are uh, we don't know yet if, we, if we're going to get the funding so knock on wood um, finger crossed fingers crossed everything crossed um, yeah, so that's basically uh, what the presentation will be about. So what are, what are the kind of tools that we are using to create this corpus for once, hopefully, we get this funding. So I'm going to talk a little bit more about the corpus, and then Luigi is going to talk about the, this, the annotation and the tools that we're using for that. First up, what are then these novels? So this is a list, right? And uh, these are the, the novels that we, that we collect. And you can obviously see why we collect these. So on the right, you have there the number of languages these, these novels and this diary uh, by Anna Frank have been, have been translated in. So these are widely translated works of uh, written works. Um, we, we have chosen these mostly because they are so widely translated, but also because they come from a wide, wide variety of source languages. So we have eight source languages there. Um, and we thought that this was pretty important because otherwise, if we would go, for example, for 1984 uh, Animal Farm, right? We have a very English biased corpus. So we've tried to mitigate this a little bit, even though it's still pretty English biased because we have all of these Harry Potter novels. So some of these texts are obviously much more widely translated than others, right? So these, this is basically uh, Alice in Wonderland, The Little Prince, the first Harry Potter book and the uh, Alchem Alchemist by Coelho. So there you have two English, uh, yeah, well, you have these, these works that are really, really widely translated. And we're hoping to make a corpus out of that with 80 languages, if we can get all of the Harry Potter translations. But this is, this is where things become tricky, right? So what we are, our process is such that we buy the books. Uh, and this is, not so easy. We yeah. are literally <laughs> surrounded by... Yes, the office is full of them. Um, we buy them, we OCR them, and we hire native speakers most of the time, or good multilingual speakers that can correct the OCR. Um, in, in collecting, there are obviously some problems, right? So there are some books that we simply cannot buy for various reasons. So for example, some of the Harry Potter books, um, if you want to research it, it's called the Big Six. So the Big Six, they are, I think, Nepali, uh, Gujarati, Macedonian. Anyway, you, you can't find uh, the Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone in these languages anymore because they are collector's items that will go for hundreds of euros, but nobody wants to sell them, obviously, because you know, in a couple of decades, they might even be thousands. Um, so there's that problem. Then there is the problem of 
um, sometimes you just you know stuff exists but you can't find it because it's published in a language that in a, in a country that doesn't have a proper national library or because they have been burned at some places or another problems are abbreviated or well, abridged versions or versions that have otherwise been changed so for example the harry potter translations in persian uh, there's some kissing not much in harry potter and they you know they do stuff <laughs> to those particular uh, segments of text then we face the order the the problem of the, the ocr process so for latin scripts so languages that are written in latin scripts is actually okay so right now uh, we are working for example on albanian and my approximation is that if a, a good student assistant works on these 18 novels to really carefully correct OCR, it takes a year for a part-time job. Um, so like eight hours a week. Also, because otherwise, if you, you know, if you try to give them more hours, they obviously go insane. So you don't want that. So I've been, we are, the, the, the tools that we are using for that are Tesseract. Uh, so that's open source OCR software in Google, which is obviously also open source, um, but it's, the main problem is not with the Latin script languages, it's with the languages which are not in Latin script and there OCR is, it's not great, to be honest. So if you guys have any advice on that, we are very happy to take it. We have been wondering whether to use Kraken or Kraken, I don't know, which is another open source OCR tool, but you have to train it. So you have to have some computational knowledge or otherwise use some, some scripting to get rid of the most obvious OCR mistakes for languages with that are not written in Latin scripts. So that's basically the corpus building. Then one of the things that uh, we wanted to talk about is distribution, right? So copyright, obviously you guys have seen this list of books and you know that most of, so almost all of the, the, the texts in our corpus are copyright protected. So since 2018, we are, uh, well, we didn't start before 2018, so that's good. Um, we are allowed to store copies of copyrighted work digitally, right? So this is actually a form of reproduction. So we have the books in the closet and we have the files on our computers. And we are also allowed to share the data in closed circles, uh, including for, for review. So this is very helpful, but obviously we cannot make the, the full corpus publicly available. Um, and this is you know, rather sad, right? You, we do a lot of work and then you can't share it. Um, but so we aim to make a smaller version of the corpus available in, in derived text format. Um, so we have been thinking about this a little bit, what we what we could do or what we are trying to do is make a small subset of each subcorpus, right? This would be sentence aligned and annotated fully. And uh, Luigi is gonna talk about the type of an, an annotation that we're pursuing. But, and then it would, be, it would be in a derived text format, which means that we would annotate or distort the text in such a way that they constitute original works. But at the moment, uh, so when we were preparing for this uh, and previous meetings, it's unclear whether that's possible because there's been research that you, you, know, you can use if you're smart and you use computers, you can actually get the original text back even if you um, use a derived text format. And this would constitute copyright violation, not of the people that put it back together, but of the people that uh, you know send it out into the world um, in the first place. So that's rather, this is something that we're, we're researching at the moment and we hope to make this happen because obviously we would think that this is a, this is a wonderful resource uh, for typology most of all, but also for people that are working on these individual languages and that really don't have a corpus. Um, but at the moment, things look quite, look quite tough. That's it about corpus acquisition and, and management, so to speak. And now Luigi is gonna take over with, with tools and annotation, but I'll be doing the slides. Okay, yes, thank you. We have conceived uh, our corpus, our KEEP, uh, as a multi-layered corpus with different layers of annotation. First of all, we have uh, uh, metadata, uh, just a string of, of files, just a string of text in which we put things like author, translation year, original title, the, pub the publisher house, the original year of the, the publishing of the, of the work, and so on. Then we have an automatic uh, um, layer, which is uh, uh, achieved uh, through automatic annotation. We are using here uh, stand for stanza, 
we have previously used other types of, uh, of parsing, such as the uh, universal dependencies official tool, which is called UDPI. But then very recently, we uh, switched to, uh, to Stanza, which supports universal uh, dependency uh, model and uh, named, named entity recognition for, for some, for some uh, languages. Then uh, some other layers of, of annotation have been obtained by using uh, Perl or uh, Python, uh, Python scripts that are um, able to automatically annotate uh, the, the corpus for three grand surprisal and, uh, and information status. We are going to uh, focus on uh, the annotation of information status in this talk because it, it is something that uh, it's not so uh, easy to, uh, to uh, achieve, while instead, of course, universal dependencies is uh, an automatic uh, annotation and then identity recognition is as well uh, an automatic, uh, an automatic uh, annotation that has been um, in, the, in, in, in uh, recent years, have been uh, enjoyed a lot of uh, efforts. And so it's something that works pretty well, even on a text of, of fiction. Name identity recognition is usually uh, used for uh, non-fiction texts like news and, and things like that, but it works very well also for, also for fictional text as in, as in Keep. You have five minutes. Okay. Uh, of course, there are some issues with, uh, with, uh, with UD. Uh, UD uh, usually um, come in uh, UD tree banks, which are manually annotated tree banks. So they are very good. Uh, and they are very good. They are very good annotation. However, when we are going to parse text by using uh, universal dependencies, uh, a certain a certain amount of noise uh, arise. A certain amount of noise arise. We have investigated in. Um, some some papers, the quality of, of the of the syntactic parting, and also uh, Natalia Lievshina has done has done some work, which I which I've quoted in uh, uh, which I quoted on the on the slides. In order to um, reduce the amount of noise, we we can retrain parses with additionally um, uh, manually parsed data. Uh, or uh, using uh, using queries and using uh, combining multiple annotation layers, we can achieve better results in order to circumvent the possible errors that are uh, that are done by by automatic by automatic parsing. Cool. Uh, in order to annotate uh, uh, keep for information status, for, for, for information status, we are going to uh, use these, uh, uh, these refex annotation schema developed by uh, Rister and, and Bowman. We have tried to uh, develop a way to do this in a semi automatic way. And we are going to see in a very small time how. Uh, we basically uh, use uh, an hybrid approach in order to crowdsourcing original information status annotation. We ask people through crowdsourcing to annotate uh, given uh, uh, information, information status, uh, and other types of uh, information status uh, data. And then uh, usually, and, and, and then using uh, automatic tools like uh, uh, sentence uh, alignment or token alignment, we try to annotate the original, probably the, the English text, to other to other translation in order to uh, expand, in order to uh, yes expand uh, original information status, which are crowdsources to to uh, target to target text. We are going to see if 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 it can work, but. It's a possible. It's a, it's a possible solution. Here we have a, a slide with some state of art tools for sentence uh, alignment. We have tried uh, blue align, uh, unalign, and uh, and vec align. And uh, I, as uh, as I said before, we are also uh, investigating if we can use uh, token token alignment instead of sentence of sentence alignment in order to export uh, this information status originally done on English or maybe other texts, or maybe other languages. 
maybe you can skip uh, this one. This one? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, this is a, a, a brief summary on uh, how uh, we are going to uh, extend the uh, original uh, English English annotation to uh, to other languages by using sentence alignment, by using word alignment, or in the in the slides that I skipped for reason of time, uh, the annotation project uh, exploiting exploiting the universal dependency relation and exploiting the annotation projection in order to achieve a better a, a better sentence uh, uh, alignment and so in order to project on non English non-English text, the original information status uh, annotation. Then here we have instead uh, an overview of our querying and data uh, management. We basically start from Conlu files, which are uh, automatically obtained by the UD parser. Then using a, a series of, of Python script, we orchestrate between different formats. We orchestrate between XML formats, which is then turned into verticalized file. Then the verticalized file can be encoded using C uh, CWU encode in Corpus Workbench and then queried uh, using CQP web. Or alternatively, we, we can uh, feed the VRT files into a SQL database and then query our database using, uh, I don't know, MySQL client or, or, or other types of, of sequence syntax. We can also use Python scripts in order to directly uh, query Conlu, Conlu files. This is what we have done so far for investigating <laughs> how you much does the word of vary in European languages. These are two uh, uh, upcoming, upcoming uh, and incoming uh, works that are about to appear. And then we have also a pair of, of works with other uh, colleagues. One, uh, both they are using uh, phylogenetic and Marie is a phylogenetic uh, expert. So we are trying to combine the phylogenetic expertise of Anne-Marie and the corpus-based uh, approach that uh, uh, nowadays in, in typology under the label of token-based typology is becoming very, very uh, familiar, I, I would say. And I guess... Yeah, we're, we're out of time. We are out of time. <laughs> <laughs> but it's also the last slide. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, it's very, very impressive how many languages you have uh, and all the work you're doing. Um, I had a question, a naive question about how you deal with metadata and standardization of your metadata. And that, since you have, yeah, and, and the second question about um, uh, sharing, I know that you have copyright uh, restrictions and of course you cannot share your corpus, but um, uh, you can share your guidelines or some kind of manual for coding or for annotation or for step-by-step yeah. -step, uh, dealing with your corpus. But as you mentioned that that's at some point a strategy of creating a sub-corpus mm -hmm. that you can share. Eventually, one idea would be to do this through Clarin. I was mentioning earlier the um, Clarin uh, resource families. And we have a specific family for parallel corpora. Maybe your Mimi Keep Plus uh, <laughs> uh, could be shared in this um, in this platform, and th that way it can be also used by others. Or so, a question about metadata: how you deal with these, and if you have any other ideas about um, uh, OCR problems with. Um, Rare languages, let's say. Um, well, uh, we, as as for OCR, uh, well, we we are of course committed to buy the physical books for uh, uh, for mostly bureaucratic, mostly for, for bureaucratic uh, reasons for the university and so on. But we are also uh, seeking to buy the digital format of, of these books. Of course, if we have the digital formats and the digital formats is not protected, as it happens with uh, several EPUB files, of course, it's very easy to 
export the, the EPUB into, into text format. And so we don't need any more OCR. Well, we still need some type of uh, tweakings of, of the corpus, for instance, removing notes uh, yeah. or stuff like that. But still, uh, uh, it's far easier and faster than <laughs> OCR, a physical text, and, uh, and, correct, and correct it. Yeah. And uh, the questions about metadata uh, was about storing metadata or... Uh, or the format, if you have uh, some kind of um, thing. Well, uh, yeah. yes, yes. We, uh, we have a very simple format in which mm -hmm. we store metadata. We have just a string of text which are prepended by uh, Annette. It's a format developed by Anne-Marie Felker here. <laughs> no! <laughs> <laughs> Not and true. well, metadata are stored are extracted from the from the text files, then are stored as separate files. Then the conlu files is generated, and when we are going to I don't know encode the corpus, so we are going to need the uh, uh, worky files or the XML files. Then the scripts again combine the two the two the two files, the metadata file, the metadata file, and the conlu file. Then we need the. Thank you. Questions. Thank you very much. I see no other questions. I have a question myself about the information oh, status. In the chat. Oh, just now. Yeah, that's right. So let me read the question. Thank you for your presentation. Would the mini corpus be shareable if you did a short of anonymization where not only proper nouns, but also other nouns get substituted with some sort of label? Yeah, so this is actually a form of derived text format that Christina hints at the problem is that so for our purposes um, we can't distort things too much because we are interested in information status and of course if you take stuff out for example that has to do with co-reference then you know what's the point but then again on the other hand maybe we should um, make a version of the corpus which actually does scramble things beyond our use but that can still be used for by other people and indeed where you would um, there you would take out proper nouns so that the text is no longer interesting to read, but you would make a label like pop n or something like that. You would do the same for certain function words like articles and, and prepositions. But of course, then of course, you know, then it becomes less interesting for people who want to research exactly that thing. But, you know, yeah, maybe that could be a somewhere a compromise, right? Some midway solution, yeah. Yeah, of course, another type of sharing is, uh... The, deriving, deriving, yeah. de derived data like uh, I don't know, list of engrams, yeah, or, uh, or yeah. things like that, like Google engrams. Yes, this is something that we can actually share because that's not something that you can ever, of course, ever build back into the original text. No, yeah. there are just numbers. So yeah, uh, I oh here is another question just appeared. Uh, so thank you, Colossal pro Project. You mentioned sentence alignment. I wonder if you could say a bit more on how you went about doing this, please. So we haven't. So we have done it partially. So Luigi has done part of it with the with the CQP tools. Uh, yes. Well, uh, I of course firstly tried with uh, uh, the official uh, alignment tool shipped in uh, CQP, which is uh, C, CWB alignment, which works pretty well. But of course, for uh, European languages or languages using uh, Latin, uh, using language using the Latin script, uh, I think that if, if you are going to align using CWB align, I, I don't know, Mandarin and English, it doesn't work. So it doesn't work so well. Then, uh, We've also been uh, trying uh, uh, these open source uh, softwares, and the best one is probably uh, this uh, Vecline. We are we have done this in preparation of the of the of the founding of, of, meeting, of, yeah. of the founding meeting on, on the founding request meeting. So these are um, I don't know uh, preparatory work. For, yeah. Yeah. So uh, yeah, you have to check whether both whether the pair of languages is both supported. And for our case, it's even more annoying because we have forty three languages, so they have to be paired 
Yes. I don't know. It's like 43 times 42 into one. Yes. yes. Um, Minus 43. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so it's actually a lot of pairings. And Rebecca Line has at least at the moment 39 out of 43 languages. So that's pretty, seems pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Any more? Uh, they want the names of the software again. So maybe uh, right now I'm sharing my screen again. Mm -hmm. um, Antonina, maybe you can just make a screenshot. Would that be yeah. okay? It's called Vecaline. Vecaline. It's the third one. VEC align. And then we will share the presentation afterwards, yeah. right? So, yeah. yeah. Talking about this uh, yeah. information status. Uh, yeah. Sorry, Eva. <laughs> Okay, go on. Presentations will be online after the event and also the recordings in the Clarin channel so we can play it again. <laughs> and I just want to know one more little question rela related to the information uh, status, the annotation tool. Is it fully automated yet? Uh, do you have an output that says given, new, and these kind of things for each file? No. What, what exactly do you have? So. Uh, and do you intend to have a tool delivered in Python, for example, in the next few months or whatever? Maybe it can be trained once we have uh, once we have a manual annotation. Well, the yeah. the, the idea I I had to I, I had to go fast unfortunately for reason of time. But the idea is to annotate the English text using crowdsourcing, and then export, then expands this type of annotation to other languages by exploiting sentence alignment and word alignment and word alignment yeah. so, so there's a couple of other approaches that one might take right one might take um train try and train a tool that can do that on a corpus that you have annotated or a part of the corpus this is also something that we are considering um, and that actually might work well and then there are other tools that do partial work right so there's um anafora resolution anafora resolution and there are open source yeah. Uh, material for that that also also want aim to do these tasks yeah. also across Stan, a variety of languages. Also, yeah. Stanza has some support of an Afro resolution. Of course, an Afro resolution is very important in information status because yeah. Jeez, yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. You have a question, and I think then we'll have to move on to. Yes, of course. I'm not sure we have enough time. I'm sorry for the the lack of time. Um, your project uh, need to be uh, present with more time. Uh, I have just a little question about the, the technique you use for um, phylogenetical uh, method. Mm -hmm. What are the, um, the, the data you use to provide the, the trees or so to the generate a tree? So we don't generate trees, but rather we, let's say, simulate evolution on the branches of existing trees. So we don't build them ourselves. We rather take them okay. from the literature. Okay. And then we use, so the, the actual term is phylogenetic comparative analysis that we, yeah. So we can, for example, see if there are correlations between, for example, between the amount of uh, sentences that are verb initial and, whatever else other feature and also okay. obviously variables related to information status which are gathered the idea is to combine phyl phylogenetic comparative analysis with corpus data yeah with data extracted from, uh, from the corpus for instance the entropy of word order or the entropy of clause and and and, and metrics and and so on yeah it's very interesting thank you thank you thank you for having us very much. Um, I think that Jennifer from Inalico is, has a question on the chat. Maybe you could answer. Uh, you can write down the answer because we have no more time. Yes, <laughs> yeah. I will do that. And then and we'll I will pass the um, floor to Thomas um, for the last presentation. So um, um, just a few words about uh, his work here in his, his presentation. So. Uh, our last speaker and co-organizer of this event is Thomas Bella, Associate Professor of Corpus Linguistics at the University of Rennes in France. And he's working at the intersection between natural language processing, corpus linguistics, and statistics. 
Uh, his current research is mostly focused on language acquisition questions, the development of tools that automatically extract and visualize linguistic profiles uh, in texts written by learners of English. He will talk about dynamic architecture in uh, structuring and analyzing comparable learner data and present the case of French and English corpus interlangue. So let's go. So uh, the work I'm going to present is based on a huge team effort that has been a long lasting effort at the uh, DGL team uh, here in Rennes. And the effort is about uh, building a corpus of learner corpus, uh, uh, of learner English and learner French. Um, in order to make it clear how we work, first I'm going to talk about the corpus itself, how it's structured, how we built it, how we transcribed it, and how uh, it was manually annotated for some type of annotation, of course. Then I will cover the idea of, uh, of the data and how it's managed, extracted, and also uh, annotated automatically in terms of uh, parsing information and morphosyntactic information. I will then give you, show you a demo of how you query the corpus with the number of R scripts that we have made available to the community. And I will conclude with a uh, short discussion talking about the limitations and future perspectives that we have uh, for the project. So in terms of what the corpus is, uh, it's actually a collection of uh, two types of productions done by learners of English and French. Um, our learners um, have a recording, um, an interview, so we have spoken productions that are recorded, 20 minute long productions, and we also request the learners of English and learners of French to write a short text, um, which is the follow up of a prompt in which they have to invent a dialogue. And so we collect a number of items. Um, the first set of items, as I said, is the, the spoken uh, part of the corpus. And it's conducted by our master students uh, in our research in our research team. We have a, a, master's, uh, um, a master's dedicated to uh, didactics. And we have learners, uh, we have people who want to become teachers of English as a foreign language or teachers of, uh, of French as a foreign language. So they go and find one uh, learner of a, one of the, their target language and they interview that person for 10 to 15, 20 minutes and they record this. They also get the person to read a, ta uh, a text. Um, and they also get the person to write uh, a text. All of this data is collected and the question then was to store the data. Historically, this corpus was started off in 2008, and it was started off by uh, um, a PhD student who stored it on, on disk, and it was passed on from one PhD student to another PhD student. And lately, um, last year, uh, we decided to embark in the digitalization and the compilation of the corpus, compiling all the text uh, files and making them available on the public uh, repository. And this is the work I'm going to show. The corpus also includes metadata. Um, we have recording details such as the date of recording and so on, but we also have sociological information about the, the speakers, their occupation, their second language, their third language and in their native language. We know which countries they have visited. We have their date of birth. Uh, all of this information is, of course, anonymized to be compliant with the GDRP, and we do have a copy, but on uh, a private uh, drives of uh, personal information, but I should say, in fact, the, uh, the corpus is pseudonymized rather than anonymized because we try, can always trace back who actually said something, but what is public is not, uh, is pseudonymized. The corpus is small. Um, it's, a, it, it's, it's a lot of years, uh, but the work has been tedious because it requires, uh, it includes uh, more than 100 recordings of more than 100 learners. You see 87 because when compiling all of the corpus files, we realized that we had some data loss. 
um, in the name, for example, of authorization. So that prevented us from uh, um, making these recordings available to the community. So altogether, we were able to uh, salvage about 87 learners, uh, 75 are French uh, learners of French and 12 of learners uh, of English as a foreign language. And as they came, the file were located in two different two different uh, directories and we have uh, for French, uh, for learners of French, we have people of different L1s as you can see. Uh, regarding uh, people are, who, lear who are learning English, uh, we had, we just recorded French, be French, uh, French natives. Um, the corpus, um, once it was collected as part of a class that we have in our masters, the students, the master students are required, uh, requested to go and find a learner and to record the, lear the learner and then to do the transcription and to do the alignment of the transcription. Um, all this by using initially CLAN, but now for the last three years, we're asking the students to use ELAN, which is a more intuitive and a more versatile platform. So the corpus is transcribed, but we also ask the students to provide some uh, common European framework of reference uh, information that tells us about the proficiency uh, of the learners in their um, respective uh, language. So we ask the students, um, the learners to self-assess themselves, but we also ask our master students to assess our uh, the, each one of their students um, with the, the CF4 descriptors. All these files are then collected um, compiled, uh, stored on a local, on a, sir, on a local university drive where I verify their, uh, their stealth, should I say, their formatting. I verify that all the files are there and that all the students have provided all the, 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 the different files, transcription, audio, and so on. And then with the help of an intern um, specialized in uh, computer science, um, we uploaded the, uh, the different files on the Nakala Humanum uh, platform that is provided by the Humanum Consortium that uh, Christophe Paris mentioned earlier on. What we decided is that we have uh, for one learner and you have anonymous ID number on the screen. For one learner, we have a number of different files. So for example, for the first learner, it has been anonymized and we can see that this first learner has produced a number of uh, different files. The SHA file, historic, uh, but the EAF file, which comes from ELAN, we have the WAVE. We have a metadata file, which is a CSV file, and we have the reading task, which is another WAVE file, and we have the writing task, a task which is a text file. Um, the files are um, on, uh, as I said, Nakala, and Nakala offers the possibility to uh, query each one of the files because each one of the files is provided automatically with a specific URL. So as you can see, for example, the SHA file here, which is selected, has a specific URL that a program can retrieve so that the program can actually act and handle that particular file before it moves on. So in the tools that I will show you later on, we uh, wrote a number of programs that access certain types of files and so that we can then uh, handle them and enrich them and do whatever processing that we want to, with the different NLP tools. Um, the target level of analysis, well, this corpus provides uh, the possibility to do some phonological work, but also some morphological and syntax work, because as part of the files, that the scripts that we provide, uh, we apply universal dependencies, but the user is more than welcome and can modify the files and apply other models to, to, to do some, uh, some, some annotation. The output of the files of the of the of the extraction process is a data set, and this data set um, is not meant necessarily for 
um, let's say, human uh, exploration, like manual in, uh, exploration, but rather it is more for modeling. And I will come back to this in a minute. Um, so we actually, uh, to do this extraction and this annotation process, we provided, we created a series of tools that we call seal query pipeline. It's a series of three R scripts. And the first script does an extraction of a certain file type as we want, as the user wants. Then there's a second phase where the uh, user will run an annotation uh, script, which will use UD pipe, but it could be another uh, a model that could be used. And then there is the analysis and I will give a couple of examples. So, um, the idea here is that I created a demo. I run the, the, the pipeline yesterday, but I prefer to do a, a video to make sure that there's no uh, glitch in the system. And I'm going to run the video. There's no sound with it. I'm just going to comment as things go. It's three minutes long. So the first thing is that you can see we have three files. The first file is create data R. The second is uh, the seal query. And the third one is to visualize. And when you open these files in R Studio, and this is the prerequisite, you can see that the three tabs show you the different, uh, the different files. So create data is the first file that you activate. You need to modify your path so that it uh, points to your drive. And then with clicking on source, you start uh, running the program. So the first thing you need to provide is the connection key to Nakala. And that means that you have to have a, uh, an account. And with that connection key, you can use the collection ID, which is provided in the introductory part of the website. And then we provide, for example, here, the fact that we want EAF files, that is the transcriptions of the audio files. As you can see, the program connects onto the server and downloads uh, the information that we have required. It has downloaded um, not only the EAF files, but it has also queried at the same time the, uh, the metadata file. And it created this my data uh, CSV file, which includes uh, the text, the transcriptions, as well as the metadata from the learners. The second part is to run seal query or where we are going to run uh, UD pipe in order to uh, apply morphosyntactic annotation to uh, the transcriptions that were downloaded. Uh, we just run the source once again, and this part actually takes long, uh, quite a long time, depending on the power of your machine. I shortened the video, so we're not going to see all of it, but it can take up to five to 10 minutes, depending on the amount of data that you have and your CPU. As you can see, it takes a lot of power. It takes a, a full CPU and it's a single thread. So it's kind of slow. You need to be patient. In the meantime, you can see that we can add a number of features with UD pipe, uh, different linguistic features uh, like gender, for example. And once the process is over, two new files are created. One is mydata.fr and the other one is mydata.en. Uh, so we have one, one data set for French and one data set for the texts in English. It is then uh, time to move on to the analysis, the C point that I was talking about. And here we provide just a, a play a script, which actually comes from our uh, UD pipe uh, website. And from that website, we extract the number of, of short snippets of script. And we're showing you here a quick example of what you can uh, run. Um, you can use uh, these scripts to have a statistical analysis and to extract keywords from the transcriptions of the French uh, subset. And as you can see, OR has gone through all the, run the algorithm and has gone through all the different words and managed to extract the main keywords of the, uh, of, of the, the, uh, the corpus. So, that's for the uh, demo and I'm not launching it again. Um, so in order to, to discuss what we have is that our initial aim was to create a pipeline to 
compile the corpus to format it in such a way that all the files are comparable and are parallel. What we have now is the possibility to compare learners of French and learners of English because all the data goes through the exact same type of, uh, uh, of processing. And at the end, I could extract the same kind of graph for the French learners who have been working on the same, for the, for the English learners who have been working on the same tasks and we have comparability and the ability to see what kind of keywords, for example, these people extract. But we could do a lot more and this is open to the creativity of the researcher and his programming skills or her programming skills. Um, so this pipeline is available. Um, in terms of implications, it means that we have live queries and, and when the corpus gets updated, if you rerun the script, you get uh, the same, uh, you, you will have new, uh, you will update your entire data set and, and, and update the analysis and maybe get new results or confirm the results. Um, this uh, process is not so much for manual exploration. Even though there is a manual interface to access the corpus where uh, the public can go and check the, the interface and have access to every single file and listen to the files online, this is possible. Um, but rather it is dedicated, it's, the idea is to produce data sets automatically from our corpus so that people can do some modeling can, um, for example, model proficiency in relation to a number of linguistic features that have been extracted automatically. That's more like the, the use that, that we intend in that case. And one other implication is that it requires understanding in R scripting to some extent in order to modify the scripts, especially the third script, which is just a toy script. And of course, more can be done in, in this area. There are a number of limitations. Um, the size of the corpus, it's, it's rather small as it stands. Now it's an oral corpus mostly. So um, in terms of spoken learner corpora, it's not that small, but it's true that if we compare it to general corpora, it, it seems rather small. And the English subset is quite small. And um, so there is more work to be done in that direction. The good news is that we have this class every year with our students. And that means that every year the corpus will get updated and we have no intention of stopping that task because it's been very uh, productive uh, for the data that we produce, but also for our students, because it gives them a real hands-on project on which to work, meeting students, talking to students, transcribing, annotating. And, and in that process, they, they face a lot of issues that we researchers in corpus linguistics face. Uh, there are a number of, really, of problems that are in this corpus. Some of the met metadata is sparse. Um, its elements are missing at times. And this could be a problem depending on what a researcher would be looking for. And another issue is that uh, we, have, we haven't evaluated the agreement between our students uh, when they uh, provide a uh, CEF or class for each one of the, the, the productions from our learners. So th this is something to, to be done as well. In terms of future perspectives, a, well, we will certainly continue uh, the collection. Um, we will continue storing the data on Nakala and make it available to the community. And the idea is, of course, to allow uh, our students or the researchers to have access to the data, but also to act as a, to provide a connector. Um, Nakala comes with APIs, application programming interfaces, which means that um, uh, programs can plug themselves into our data and extract it uh, automatically at will. And if the data is updated uh, on the server, then they just the, the tools will get updated results automatically. The data is available uh, on the following address that you can see, corpusinterlangue.nakala.fr. This is the, I should say, the manual exploration of the corpus. You will have access to the data management plan, the documentation, the ID of the collection of this corpus that you need to enter in the script, and you will have a brief introduction. Um, and you will also have a link 
to what you have, the GitHub uh, that gives you access to the three scripts that I've shown uh, as part of the demo. Um, this work was initially started by uh, Naji Barbak as part of his PhD and uh, has been continued, has been, uh, you know, uh, completed over the years by many different uh, actors. Um, and so that's it. I am finished. Thank you. Um, we have some time for questions. And uh, you shouldn't hesitate either to react uh, with um, the Zoom tool or just write uh, something on the chat. And if you're a student, don't hesitate to ask your questions. In the meanwhile, I have a question. <laughs> Go on. Um, I have a lot of questions. In fact, uh, so um, you presented um, a tool where um, you have lots of um, document, lots of files in Clan in um, in Elan. Uh, if someone wants to uh, run an analysis on parts of speech, uh, does he have to uh, run first uh, some kind of morphological library uh, like more in Clan? Uh, does the file has to be already annotated for um, for um, grammatical categories, or uh, the program just recognizes uh, English and French uh, categories? Okay, so in fact, uh, what is on the server um, does not include any kind of morphosyntactic annotation. There is no part part of speech, for example. In fact, the um, the tack that we decided uh, to go for is that when the the data is extracted, when we run the third the second script, the seal query script. At this point in the program, we trigger the download of the UDPipe tool, and UDPipe does this exactly, post-tagging as well as uh, parsing. And so you when you run this script, the output is a new file that includes part of speech information, more uh, parsing information as well in terms of dependencies, but it also includes another set of features that are described by, by UDPipe documentation, but it includes uh, features that are related to a particular language like gender in French, for example. It can include uh, features such as uh, the modality of, of different words in the in in the different tokens that are in, in the in the in the new data set. So it's at the moment when you have downloaded and you run seal query that we activate this tool that will produce a new data set that creates a rich linguistic data set. It includes many columns. I'm not going to expand, but you have the text, you have the sentences, you've got the tokens, you've got the posts, you've got the dependencies, you've got a lot of things. It's quite rich. Um, and from that on, then you can uh, decide to apply filters and, and, uh, and create the kind of analysis that you want. And then you have to correct uh, some of these columns uh, or uh, there are okay. no errors. <laughs> I mean, there are uh, probably. I suppose that you have to check manually uh, what the program has done. Yes, uh, we do not. I mean, we we trigger uh, as a, as a as a tool. We trigger uh, UD pipe. UD pipe has been evaluated in different contexts. We do not provide the evaluation on our data. Okay, and this is certainly something that should be done. Um, but the idea was to create the 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 pipeline so that people can use the data. But I agree with you. Um, we know that post tagging is quite safe in terms of English. Um, it has been tested and it works okay. Uh, parsing has been tested by Yana Kudis as well and her team um, in King's College. And it seems that with Learner English, it, it, throws, it, it doesn't throw so many errors, um, but we do not provide an evaluation ourselves uh, based on our corpus. And I would certainly agree with you that the, once the, um, the, the, the tool has been used, it would be uh, important to uh, run an evaluation on a, on a sample of the data in order to, to quantify the number of errors um, in the particular type of annotation that the user is interested in. Mm -hmm. Thank you. We have a question from Christina. Um, thank you for the great presentation. 
How long do you train your students before they start collecting data? And was there anything particularly difficult in their training? Do they check each other's data? Do you have uh, some kind of peer support? Yes, okay, so um, the course starts in September, but this actual class actually starts in, in January and it, over the course of six weeks. And we spend the first three weeks explaining uh, the protocol and the, work, the students work in pair. Um, so they have to go together um, on the field, find the learner on the field and do the transcription together. So for a start, the transcription is actually verified by two humans. Um, still talking about the, 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 the transcription, I myself then collect all the, the files and I will go through the transcriptions as well and try to see if there are some, um, I'm not correcting absolutely everything because obviously 50 students would be too long, but I go through them very quickly and I try to see if there are some um, incongruities or things that need to be flagged. Yeah. Um, there was anything, so if there is anything particular difficult, yes, it's quite technical. Um, the, um, the Katarina, I think you've got your mic. Okay. It's quite technical. The uh, students are not super computer literate and some, I, I, I need to spend a lot of time explaining how the technicalities of the project work. And initially it seems complex to them. Uh, but after three or four weeks um, of showing them, of giving them one file to deal with, of using the Moodle platform to ask them to provide the file just to me, they don't have to do anything with Nakala, uh, they uh, submit the files on a normal um, uh, space in Moodle, um, they get to understand. And the fact that they're working in pairs uh, is also positive because there's always someone who is more computer literate. And they, of course, as well, find help within the entire group. Um, and, and so when there are technical issues, they, they can do that. The other thing is that I created a, a, a form on the online course that supports the class and people can ask questions and, and they do that and the, the following class. But there is a learning curve that definitely is something to, to be patient with. And you have to be extremely uh, pedagogical. That's that's definitely a point. Yeah. Thank you very much, and Luigi. Yes, thank you for your very interesting presentation. Just a quick technical version uh, questions. You are using which version of UDPipe? Uh, UDPipe one. Uh, yes, UDPipe one. Version number one. So yeah. the UD models uh, to. Dot yeah. five. Okay. Okay. Different I, multilingual models. Yeah. Yes, as I mentioned, the uh, stanza includes uh, uh, newer uh, models, so may, maybe yes. you can try to use uh, to use stanza with Python. I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. Um, I, thank you for pointing this out. It shows that we have uh, work in common because um, um, I wanted to ask you the question. Um, not in this particular project, but I'm interested in information status as well mm -hmm. um, in order to, to do work on, on referential forms like this and that in English. Mm -hmm. And um, I have tried to train um, UDPipe uh, to, um, on the GUM corpus because the GUM mm -hmm. corpus includes this kind of information status in, in the corpus. Okay. But to which is a pedagogical corpus, so it's it's very it's very close to yours. Yes, and it yeah. includes information status. And once I trained the data, I was hoping that the last two columns of the kernel format in the files would include this information, mm -hmm. but it doesn't. So and then by going around the web, I I saw that it's it's not supported yet. So I'm okay. I'm in in I'm in search for a tool that would automatically annotate information status. Hence my question mm -hmm. initially. Stanza, as you're saying, mm -hmm. does provide this kind of data, does it? Uh, it provides named entity recognition, not any or. Uh, okay. Yes. UDPI mm -hmm. provides any or as well, as far as I, I, I know. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I didn't know that, but uh, Stanza for sure provides named entity recognition, like think is a place, think is, a, I don't know, an object, a person, yes. and so on, which is quite useful for information structure because, of course, human reference uh, are always, uh, are, have always 
certain features like in terms of information structure yes. so yeah mm. but it is a, a challenge another challenge that i didn't mention is um the models that we uh, we use the ud pipe french model and the ud pipe uh, english model mm -hmm were trained on on written data so mm -hmm. here again uh, to go back to get back to what you were saying eva this is you know we're working on oral data so this is more like to show what can be done but certainly there are probably a lot more errors because it's it's running on oral data and um what would be needed is to train uh, UD pipe to create a model, an oral model of, of, of spoken English and of spoken French. Otherwise, you can try pre-trained models, uh, uh, UD pre-trained models using oral uh, oral data. There are some uh, uh, English, I guess, and also oh, okay. French. There yes, we go. You, so you can check the. I, I will paste to the chat the. Okay. So, of, of in models. fact, it's it's really interesting because instead of uh, pointing to one model uh, that gets downloaded, the the users would just need to find the name, the file name of the 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 old the spoken model. Uh, exactly. And they would just change the name in the script, and that means that the script would download this model and and apply annotation on the basis of this model, which would be certainly more accurate. Precisely. Yes, there is. For instance, there is this French spoken uh, package okay. in uh, instance already, which is a UD again, which is a UD model. That's great. Thank you yeah. very much. You're welcome. Okay, that was a great moment. Great presentations. Thank you. Many, many thanks to all the speakers. Uh, many thanks to all the audience. Uh, thanks to Eva, who presents uh, Clarin Resources and the role of the Knowledge Centers. She's the best ambassador we can hope for Clarin. <laughs> Thank you also to Christophe Paris and uh, Céline Pouda, who both lead Corlys since nearly five years with serious involvement and motivation. I would especially thank both of you for your availability and the time you spend animating this great network. Um, just a few words to say that the original ID was proposed by Antonio Balve in a meeting of the Corley Working Groups on Multilingual Corpora. At the beginning, we wanted to identify some multilingual corpora that are being built or that were not well known or currently not identified on Clarin Resource um, website. Finally, Antonio, due to his very busy schedule, decided to let, uh, let us deal with the project. In the last few war, uh, months, uh, we changed our mind a little and we decided to focus on uh, some particular corpora in order to provide demonstration on how to collect, build, um, annotate, explore, etc. As mentioned in the online program, we wanted to have a more pedagogical perspective. We hope this would be useful for students and more generally for the community of researcher. And then Eva suggests that we submit, submit a proposal to Clarin Cafe that we, we did. You just saw the results. So we listen with great interest our speakers presenting three very different corpora, a multi-dialectal corpus by uh, Maximilien Guérin, a parallel corpus by Anne-Marie Verkerk and Luigi Talamo, and a comparable uh, learner corpus by uh, Thomas Gaia. Maximilien Guérin presenting his multi-dialectal corpus of the Christian dialects, uh, works actually on endangered languages and dialects because these varieties stop to be transmitted. The corpus he presents is in some ways a rescue corpus aiming to save this particular dialect. To do so, he makes surveys and uh, records and recorded many speakers to build an oral corpus. In the same time, all data were also transcribed with translation. 
the focus is to mainly to collect material. But in the future, the transcription will be annotated with a special target levels in phonology and morphology. Some results allowed to, for example, to draw maps and various studies on grammatical description and translation of a parallel corpus based on the little prints. Anne-Marie Verkerk and Luigi Talamo um, building the KIP plus the parallel corpus of uh, Indo-European prose um, present a very large corpus that includes 80 books translated in many languages. And sometimes collecting the book was not so easy that it seems. Excepted, excepted for Latin script, OCR in other script arose some issue. It was surprising. Um, they also um, uh, have to deal with uh, copyright, which implies generating a mini corpus. Technically, they use a multi-layer structure and automatically annotated and parsed according universal dependency with name, identities, etc. 43 languages subcorpus are notated to be Elling allowed a huge variety of research, like research on world order, uh, languages, typology, etc. Um, and finally, uh, Thomas Gaia. Sorry. Um, I showed how metadata are important in some research. Um, he showed that students make their own transcription using Elan, and all the files generated, sound, metadata, annotations are stored on Nakala repository. He demonstrates how the UD pipeline analysis runs and, match, and matches up information together. It provides analysis annotated file, one in French, one in another uh, in English, which can provide statistic and keywords, for example. All the material requested the creativity of the researcher. Again, thank you very much to the speaker, and we hope that you enjoyed the presentation and that they were useful for your current or future research project. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. Um, thank you all for participating.